thank you, James, for having me and Pastor Debbie, Pastor John. It is such an honor to be here. And I, I didn't know that your pastor was Richard Gere. I had no idea that that who your pastor was, but it's been uh, awesome to, uh, when you guys talked about um, Sizzling Summer and all these things, I didn't know, um, you know, they said world-class speaker, speakers. And the first thought I had was, this is a world-class community. Like this is, we get to travel all over the world and we travel two to three times a month. And when I get into this place, I immediately know this is such a special community and such an incredible community of believers. So I just wanna let you in on a little secret, like, hey, just remember this is such a special place and what an honor it is to be a part. And I know a lot of you make that happen for, for your city, and that's pretty powerful. Um, I want to pray, and then we'll get started, and we're going to turn our books to, uh, our Bibles to the book of Numbers. So Lord, I thank you for today. Help us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I want to talk for a few minutes uh, on a, a passage that really struck me in the middle of this huge, unbelievable thing that's happening in our nation. I mean, it's just hard to, I could never get up here and act like it wasn't happening. This is just incredibly difficult and challenging. And I remember asking the Lord, Lord, what are we doing? What's going on? I, I, I know overnight we run an organization called Truth to Table, like Farm to Fork. And we, uh, overnight, 40% of our income went away and we had challenges on every front of our ministry. And I asked the Lord, what are you doing? And the Lord, be, he took me right to this passage and he talked about that there were going to be challenges and there were gonna be giants in the land, but I was not to be afraid. And so I want us to read out of the book of Numbers, chapter 13, verse 27. This is the paraphrase, this is the message version. I like it because it's more story oriented, but it gets the concept uh, to us. It says, we went to the land to which you sent us, and oh, does it flow with milk and honey. Let me give you some context. The Israelites had been in bondage in Egypt, and they were sent someone to come rescue them, Moses, to lead them out of Egypt, and they were promised this promised land. It was going to be incredible. There was going to be milk and honey. All of their, their slavery was going to go away, and so they journeyed, and when they got to the land where they knew God had brought them to, they said, let's send 12 spies, 12 leaders out of the tribes, and let them go, go scout it out and come back and report to us what is actually there. And so we're kind of right at this moment in Scripture where we're reading their their messaging, their narrative of what they saw. So the 12 spies say this, we went to the land, it was flowing with milk and honey. Just look at its fruit. The only thing um, is that the people who live there are fierce. Their cities are huge and well fortified. And we saw descendants of the giant Ozark. I meant Anak. An 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 okay, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. But <laughs> what they're saying is this, listen, we went there and as all the things God promised, but also we saw these huge giants. We saw their city was well fortified and we could not defeat them. And all of a sudden the people began to listen in and they began to worry, the Bible talks about, but then Caleb, one of the 12 spies, speaks up. And he says this, and Caleb interrupted, verse 30, called for silence because before Moses and said, let's go up and take the land now. We can do it. But the others said, we can't attack those people. They're way stronger than we are. They said, we scouted the land from one end to the other. It's a land that swallows people whole. Everybody we saw was huge. As I was brought to this passage, I was immediately reminded that we are going to face giants of many kinds in this season. We are facing giants of many kinds. And I know that we are going to face things that we have never faced collectively, uh, nationally, personally. We have never been here before. And so instead of us doing life as normal, it's going to require a humility and a vulnerability to the Spirit of God to say, show us what we need to do next to defeat the giants. Every promise that God has given you has a giant that wants to take it from you. Come on. Everything that God has promised you, there's a giant, a spirit of fear, a spirit of intimidation, a spirit of, of anxiety, a spirit of unbelief that wants to come in and tell you that God did not say that and he's not gonna fulfill his promise and he's not gonna come through and you will be mocked and you are not as big as the giant in your land. And I want you to know something. 
You are not as big as a giant in your land, but your God is. And your God is going to come and help you to defeat the enemy in your land. I think about my own life. I have faced many giants in the last 14, 16 weeks. But one of the moments in my, in my life that was happening that really kind of brought this true was I have four sons and my third son, I went to the grocery store and when I got home, we're kind of in this new journey of our 13 year old watching our boys for a little while while we go and do an errand and we just pray that God protects them. And um, I went to get groceries, I, brought, I walked inside and Grayson is on the floor and he's playing a video game. He's very happy and everything's at peace. And so I start to unload the groceries and and then all of a sudden I hear some yelling upstairs and I'm thinking, oh, the boys must be upstairs playing together. And then all of a sudden my phone rings and I look on my phone and I see that it's my eldest son's phone and he's calling me. And so I pick up my phone and I say, Judah, what's going on? And he goes, mom, we're locked upstairs in the office. All three of us were locked at Grayson locked us in the office. <laughs> well, what you don't know is that we had renovated our balcony on our master bedroom into an office and the outside door was still on that door. And so there was an outside bolt lock. So I realized that Grayson, in the middle of a fight, had led them upstairs into this office and locked them and had been hanging out for an hour playing video games, believing that all was right with the world. And so when I walked upstairs, all three of them are in the glass doors and you can see the anger on their faces. I unlock the door and they don't even greet me. They are running to Grayson to show him that that is not acceptable behavior. And I did not do a thing. I just let it happen because they need to learn that that's probably not gonna be helpful for you to lock your brothers in their room. And it's, I never interrupt the, the sowing and reaping. But anyway. They just did a little ministry of laying off of hands. But anyway, so <laughs> I was thinking about this analogy. Like many of us right now, we are faced, there are giants in the house. Grayson had some enemies in the house. He had put his brothers in this, <laughs> this office and he's thinking, I'm good to go. Everything's gonna be fine. But there was gonna be a moment when mom was gonna come home and unlock that door and they were gonna go after him. And I think that's how it's working in our lives right now. Like we can kind of act like the giants are locked up because of the stimulus package. Like our giants are locked up because, well, we're on unemployment and we're making more than we did when we were working. Come on. Well, the giants are locked up because, well, at least we can go to church. You know, not everybody else can, but we can. Or the giants are locked up because we don't have that problem or that issue or we don't have COVID, so you know, we're fine. And here's the thing, the giant represents the part of us where fear and worry and anxiety have, a t have an ability to come and attack us and leave us vulnerable and weak and without range to the promise that God has for us. You see, we can't just think that our giant is locked up there. We have to actually greet our giants and defeat our giants. That's what we're called to do. You are not called to bow down to fear. You are not called to bow down to intimidation. You are not called to shrink back and hope that if you don't go anywhere and don't do anything, it's all gonna figure itself out. No, no, it is time for us to rise up and become the people that we said we are, people of faith that believe that God can make a way where there is no way. It's time for us to rise up. We will not be able to battle our, our we, will, we will not win the battle by l living with our giants. And so I think about this reality. We are all faced with giants. I'm faced with giants, you're faced with giants. I have a pastor in town. He said in the 15 years of his thriving church, he's had more families file for divorce than all 15 years. I've had friends that have lost everything and they are both without work. People are facing enormous challenges. And sometimes we can think that the giants are gonna take us out. But every promised land has a giant. And what I know is that the giants that we face often look like this, at least to me. Giants are things too big for us to fight on our own. You might be facing some things right now where you feel like they, this is so big, there is no way I can face this on my own. I can't solve this, I can't pay for this, I can't make this work, I can't vote the right person in, I can't do all the things that I think are gonna solve it. I, I, I need God to take a hold of my nation and my family and my home. Giants keep us from our promised land. 
And giants also mock God in the presence of us. And so when a giant, we're faced with a giant, not only are we faced with things too big for us to fight, and not only are we faced with things that keep us from our promise, and not only are we faced with a mocking of who God says we are and mocking of who we believe God is, We are also faced with the reality that either we're going to believe that we have massive, enormous, economic, financial problems, and we have a very small God, or we have a huge God who can do the impossible and the miraculous, and in the sight of God, our problems seem pretty small. And we are faced every single day. The Bible says, I have set before you life and death. Every single day, we're going to have to ask ourselves, are we eating life? Or are we eating death? Are we listening to life? Or are we listening to death? Are we posting life? Or are we posting death? We have to make a decision what narrative we are going to believe. I have to make a decision what narrative I'm going to believe. I was talking to a friend recently, and they were in just really, really frantic about the culture and the nation and all of these things. And, and I looked at them and I pleaded. I said, I have got to raise four boys in this generation. And I have to have hope that God's going to do what I cannot do. And so I would rather you not give up on America or give up on the political world or give up on the relation, the, the racial relationships or give up on, on the economic or the, the global pandemic. I'd rather you not give up, but realize that we are being positioned for a promised land and there are giants, but the giants that we didn't see before were still there. We're just have, we're, they're just in, we just see them now. Let me tell you, just because we had peace in 2019 doesn't mean we didn't have giants we had to face. Our giants are just a little clearer now. And so we all have giants. You have giants as well, whether they're relational, economical, physical, financial. We all have them. And when those 12 spies went to the people of Israel, they said to the Israelites, they said, 10 of them said, this is going to be really, really bad. There's no way this, we can't do this. But there were two that said, there's, there's a way. There's a way we can fight, we can win. This is our land. You see, this is the narrative that those men of faith believed. First of all, they believed every giant can be taken. This is important. Just because a giant can be killed doesn't mean it will be killed. You have to participate and take responsibility for the giants that you face. I, if I was to give you one phrase today that you walked out with your family and you said, what was the one thing she was trying to say? I would ask you to remember this phrase. You don't have to fight every giant. You just have to fight yours. You don't have to fight every giant that you are facing. You just have to fight yours. And so we find that every giant can be taken, but we... We've got to be able to participate, but we cannot take the giants on our own. I am not going to be able to fight the giants on my own. That's why I know that the battle belongs to the Lord. We cannot have racial reconciliation in our communities and radical change without us giving the battle to the Lord. We cannot see a a healthy political environment and system without the battle belonging to the Lord. We cannot see our churches come back together and sing and worship and be in community and family without giving the battle to the Lord. We are not, God's not asking us to fight every battle. He's asking us to stand with him and he will be the defender. He will be the fighter. He will come on our behalf to lend us grace and strength and clarity. And also... You will have to defeat your giants. You cannot cohabitate with giants. Listen, I love you, but if you've allowed a spirit, a giant of fear to come into your heart, your emotions, your narrative, that giant will not allow you to be, you you cannot cohabitate with that giant. That giant will come at you when you are vulnerable and weak. And so you have to be aware of it. Some of you, just to be honest, you are living with a part of you where you are, you're battling with an emotional affair right now with somebody. And this pandemic has opened up parts of your heart and parts of your desire for adventure and you've looked online to find an old girlfriend, an old boyfriend, a coworker, somebody that you're nurturing a relationship that you know is not your spouse. 
And I want to say to you, you cannot cohabitate in covenant and cohabitate with an affair. That will come at you. It will destroy you. It will cause your family to be torn apart. You cannot play with fire and not be burned. I love you, but I'm going to tell you the truth. You're going to have to decide who you want to be right now. Whether you have the church telling you who you are, whether you have a lead pastor encouraging you, or whether you have a spouse sitting next to you, you're going to have to decide, am I going to be who I said I am, and I'm going to do what I said I'm going to do without everybody watching? Integrity is when everything gets synced up. How many of you have iCloud in your house, right? Your phone, your iPad, your computer, they all sync up, all your photos go on the same systems. That's what integrity is. Integrity is when what I say and what I do and what I believe and what I give myself to all syncs up. It all begins to be the same narrative on every front, whether it's 1 a.m. in the morning and I'm feeling fear or whether I'm in church raising my hands, it all syncs up because I have an integrity in me that says I am going to be who I say I am wherever I am. Come on. And so this is, this, this is the opportunity for us as a church to be integrous. This is an opportunity for us to say we're going to be who we said we were going to be even when the sun may not be shining and there's storm clouds in the sky. We're not going to bow down to fear. We're not going to bow down to unbelief. We're not going to be quiet. We're not going to shut up. We're not going to be hope that we just ignore this and this is going to go away. No, we're going to rise up. We're going to be the people we said we were going to be all along. Come on, you, you were created to do the hard stuff. Get your head up. You were created to do the hard stuff. You're not some casual Christian just sitting here hoping things will work out. No, no, you're a warrior. The Bible says that you have been enlisted in the body of Christ. You are part of a battle, a spiritual battle, and you are armed and ready. You don't have to walk around with your head down hoping you have what it takes. Sweetheart, you have what it takes. He lives on the inside of you. And he wants to awaken you to the reality that you don't have to feel fear all the time and dread all the time and overwhelming and and not sure. No, no, you can be confident that the God who helped you over here is going to help you over here. And there is something about, listen, there is something about secondhand knowledge and firsthand knowledge. And right now, I'll give you your prophetic word. God is taking all of your secondhand knowledge that you knew last year, and he's putting it into firsthand revelation. You say, God is for me. Now you get to find out. God's going to take care of me. Well, let's see. I trust God will do you. Now we get to see everything goes into reality. Be aware. And so I think about defeating giants. You know, David... There's a story in the Bible where David had to fight Goliath, the giant. This is kind of like our firsthand knowledge of somebody fighting the enemy. And David was the youngest of sons. And when the prophet came looking for him, nobody thought David would be a leader. And finally the prophet found him and anointed him. And then he goes back to being a shepherd and taking care of sheep. And at one point his dad says to him, hey, can you go take lunch to your brothers? They're on the battlefield. And so David gets excited. He's like, I get to watch my brothers at war. It's going to be awesome. I get to see my brothers fighting. And when he gets there, no one's fighting. Everyone's standing there. And he runs to the edge of the battle and he goes, why aren't we fighting? And the The army goes, well, you know, there's this guy named Goliath and he's intimidating us and even King Saul won't fight him. And so we're all just kind of waiting here and hoping that somebody finds the courage to fight him. And David goes, I'll fight him. I mean, could you imagine? Sometimes I think we're so religious, we don't know how to fight battles anymore. We're like, oh, I'll fight. No, no, let so-and-so. And, you know, sometimes we see new believers come in and they're like, well, I, I just prayed for the miracle. We're like, yeah, sometimes God doesn't always give miracles. Sometimes we see it on the other side of heaven. And we start to kind of water down the reality of who we really are and what we really have. And David goes, I'll fight Goliath. And they go, well, then put on the armor of Saul and we'll we'll anoint you and we'll call you. We'll make you. And David goes, no, stop. I got five smooth stones. I got a slingshot. I killed the lion and the bear. I'll kill Goliath. Let's do this. And here's what I want to tell you. The giants that you are facing, remember, we will not kill every giant, but we will kill ours. They will first, we will have to meet them where they are, and we will have to speak to our giants. 
Listen, God wants to give you a game plan for the battle that you face. I was telling this in the last service, but my eldest son really dealt with fear. And it started out when he was little, we went to wash his hair and he got soap in his eyes. And that initially kind of spooked him to taking baths and getting his hair washed. And so initially he would cry, but then it got into a full blown panic. Every time he would go to have a bath, he would start to scream. Anybody have a kid in your house that's gone through something like this? It's just, you know, or maybe a spouse. So, So he would scream and it was like torture. I'd be like, babe, it's your turn. Tap out, you're on. No, you're on. You gotta wash this hair, it's been a week. You know, we're we're trying trying to get this done because it brought anxiety, terror in the house and screaming and I hated it. And finally, Ben and I said, we have got to give Judah a plan for fear. And so we looked at Judah and his big brown eyes at five years old and we said, Judah, We know that you're scared when we go to wash your hair and we know that you scream and cry and we understand that. But what we want you to do is I want you to say, I will not fear and say it loud. I don't care if you scream it at me or you yell it, but every time you fear it, I want you just to say it. And so initially we go to wash his hair. I will not fear, I will not fear. And we're like, Judah, come on, son, say it. I will will not fear, I will not fear. And pretty soon it went from a timidity to a courage. I will not fear. And he's looking us in the eyes and he was like, I will not fear. Like he was like, I'm going to do this. And you know what? It took about two weeks and it was over. Some of you right now, you need a battle plan for your fear. You get in your car and you go, I will not fear. I will not bound onto this. Sometimes I'll say it, even if I don't feel it, I'm like, no, no, enemy, just so you know, we're not playing this game. I'm not, I will not be intimidated. I will not be afraid. I will not bow down. I will not be confused. Come on, I will not be overwhelmed. I, I have the Spirit of God in me. I will not fear. Come on. And some of you need to rise up and say, I gotta get a game plan for this. This isn't working for me. You can't wait the battle out. You have to fight the battle. Come on, look at me. I'm an Italian, I used to be intense. I will not fear. You gotta fight the battle. You can't just wait for the battle to resolve itself. So David spoke to his giant and then David used what was in his hands. Guys, the giants that you are facing right now, if you wanna defeat them, you have everything you need. You don't have to wait. You have the Spirit of God on the inside of you. He will tell you exactly what to do, when you need to do it, how you need to do it. You are not alone. Though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. It doesn't say he'll rescue us from the valley of the shadow of death. He said you will never be alone in the valley of the shadow of death. You have a companion, a partner. The Bible says the Holy Spirit, the comforter, the counselor, the one that goes before you anytime you don't know what to do or where to go or need encouragement or need community. He is like, I'm here, let's see, I'm here for it. Your calling and purpose is to do unique things. His calling and purpose is to help you. You, the Spirit of God is positioned, his entire purpose and calling is what do you need? What do you need? What do you need? How can I? Absolutely. Let's be, he's the friend that you always wanted. He's the helper in time of need. And I was thinking about this moment in my life. We went through a very, very, very tough season, even as I talk about it. You know, have you ever been through one of those seasons when you go to talk about it, you can feel your heart? Like, oh, I don't even wanna talk about this because I remember how hard this was. But many years ago, about eight years ago, we had just had our fourth son, Beckham, And I had very tough pregnancies. Um, I was on bed rest for 10 weeks, and then we would take the baby three weeks early because I had to be on medication that the baby had to be weaned from before they gave birth so the baby wouldn't be addicted to the medication. And it was just a very intense, uh, very, very intense. And I uh, gave birth to Beckham, and it didn't go as planned, and they put me out. I had four C-sections in five years, which is way more information than you need to know. I, he went into the NICU for 10 days, and when I got home with my four babies under five, recovering from my fourth C-section, I go out to do an errand, and as I'm outside at an errand, I look over at my son Grayson, and he has these red bumps all around his mouth. So we go to the emergency room because we had had a NICU baby, and they said, well, the three 
older kids have been diagnosed with hand, foot, and mouth disease, you need to be quarantined for another 10 days. So we go home, and I was going through my own battle because I had, I had postpartum depression with my three babies. And so I would have to do this road to recovery, right? It would take me months to get those serotonin levels up again and just begin to thrive again. And it was very difficult for me in the beginning stages of, of being a new mom. And so I knew that I was on that journey. I was recovering from my fourth major surgery. My kids had hand, foot, and mouth. And not only that, we are smack dab in the middle of the economic crisis of 2008 when everything was crashing in California. I know around the state, specifically in California, and half of our church community was in the real estate market. There were all kinds of lenders and real estate agents. And so we were, we were watching a mass exodus of income and the reality that people were filing bankruptcy. It was was just tragic. We lost half our staff in one year, and we knew that we were picking, taking pay cut after pay cut, believing we were going to make it through this crisis. My husband calls me one day, and he says, Havala, I have some really hard news, uh, but they have to let us go. We're not going to be able to be on staff. Now, I want you to understand, I had been in this church since I was 19 years old. I started this church I had done everything from watch children to answer phones to lead events to becoming a worship pastor for eight years and eventually a teaching pastor. I had purchased a home around the corner so that I could be there early and leave late. I was a part of this community. And not only that, when I was 17 years old, I had given my heart to Christ. I was in the backseat of a car. Some guys had picked my sister and I up to go to a party one night. And I was a church girl, which meant I wanted to be cool at school and I wanted to be cool at church, and so I just stayed under the radar. I had a deep-seated self-hatred because I had learning disabilities, and I came from a very educated family. My grandfather was a congressman, four-term Supreme Court Justice of New York State. All of my cousins and family went to Ivy League schools, and I was the girl that could barely pull a C. I was dyslexic, reading comprehension issues, and I always felt kind of broken. Messed up. So when it came to God, I didn't think God had a plan for me. I just didn't, I thought I was broken. You know, like pick somebody who has it. I don't. So I get in the backseat of this car and the music is playing and my sister and I are sitting back there. And all of a sudden I hear hear the Holy Spirit speak to me. And he says, Havala, what are you doing? And I I could feel, I I knew the presence of God because I was raised in church. I knew his voice. And so I, I, I didn't know what to do, but I heard him say, you gotta get out of this car. There's a call on your life. And so I shouted out over the music, can you turn the music down? So the guy in the front turns the music down. And I say this, cause I have no ability to know, I'm 17 and have no discretion. I say this, I have a call of God on my life. Which was like a total buzz kill. It was like. <laughs> and then I tell the guys, I'm gonna serve God and you're all gonna come with me if you want, but this is what I'm gonna do. I'm now weeping in the backseat of the car. My sister's weeping in the backseat of the car. I look out the window, they've taken us home without us asking. (laughs) We skipped the party. They're like, we still have time to get those other girls. (laughs) We get out of the car, we wander to this dark house, and I kneel down by my bed and I say this prayer out loud. God, I'm not much, I'm young, I'm a girl, I'm 17. I have no special gifts or graces. In fact, I can't think of one thing to offer you that would wow you. But if you can use anyone, you can use me. I'm available. So at 17, I give my life to Christ. At that moment, I had given everything. And now here I was in the early stages. I'm 30 years old. And I was like, God, did you bring me out here to die? Like, I've given you everything since I was 17. I've trusted you. I believed you. And now I have four kids and I don't have, we don't have a job and we don't have a plan B and there's, we don't know how this is all gonna work out. And I get, went into my bedroom, I got off the phone and I walked in and I had a full blown adult tantrum and I fell on the bed without my arms and my infant son is sitting here and my other kids are in the living room watching HBO and eating chocolate. <laughs> I'm teasing. And I said, God, what do you want me to do? And he goes, he says this so clearly. I want you to make chicken. (laughs) I was like, I sarcastically said, you make chicken. And he goes, I did. No, I'm kidding, he didn't, but he goes. 
I said, what do you mean? He goes, I want you to get up and wash your face and get ready for Ben to come home and make that really good chicken dish. My mouth is watering just talking about it. I'll give you the recipe later. And I did that. I got up, put my Frank Sinatra on and my candles lit and made my chicken dinner and Ben came home. We had a beautiful evening. We didn't talk about it to that evening after we put the kids to bed and we sat on the couch and we cried and we talked and we didn't have a plan. We didn't know what was gonna be next. We had no idea. You know, it's, it's one thing to believe God when you have a plan B. It's another thing to not have plan B. And to say, okay, God, it's all yours anyway. And I'll tell you this, you guys. I never lost hope after that moment. Nothing changed. There wasn't a check in the mail and an opportunity that was immediate. No, no, no. We had to trust God. We had to stand in faith that the giant that we faced that day was not going to keep us from the promised land that we had tomorrow. And for some of you, you are at a place right now where you are saying, God, what do I do? And you know what he's telling you? Make chicken. You go, why, why would I make chicken? Because being, defeating your giant isn't often going to be the most extravagant spiritual profound thing. Defeating your giant is going to be doing the exact thing that he asks you to do, even when no one is watching or considers it significant. Defeating your giant might be you going to work early. It might be you actually giving something when you don't have anything to give. It might be you encouraging somebody who's at a desperate place in their season. It might be you coming to church and finding your courage to gather and lift your hands and worship. It might be you not calling your spouse on everything wrong that they said. Don't look around. It might be you actually asking those closest to you for forgiveness for how you have reacted this season. Listen, you may not feel like you were trained for this, but you were made for it. And there is a God inside of you that wants to help you. And here's the truth of it all. Those, those spies that went in and told the, the people of Israel, we can take the land, there were only two of them. Those were the only two that went into the promised land. The other 10 never made it. Can I just suggest that right now it's gonna be a season where we are gonna decide if we're gonna make it or not. And we will look back, I, I prophesy this and I promise you this, 10 years from now, and we will see that this was the birthplace of every miracle that had ever happened in our life up until that point. We're gonna look at this and go, God was shifting. He was pivoting us into the promised land, into the right position, to the right place. It looked like all was lost. It looked like the giants were bigger than us and every city was fortified and the nation was shutting down and things were chaotic and we didn't know what was gonna happen. But what we saw was that God who got us out of Egypt was going to get us into the promised land and that no weapon formed against us was going to prosper. Come on, you got to get fear off of you. Some of you need to look at your giant and say, you will not defeat me. I will not fear. I will not fear. I will not fear. I will not fear. And for many of you today, I just want you to know that the Spirit of God isn't just watching you. He's gonna here to help you. I can see some of you are crying right now. And I get it. I have been at desperate places. We are up here because we are somehow all together. We're up here because we maybe need to hear it more than you. I have been at desperate places. I know what it's like to not know what's next. I know what it's like to think we don't, I don't know how to solve this. I don't know what to do. I know how that feels, but I want you to know something. God has not brought you out here to die here. And I want you to know that Egypt has nothing for you. And I want you to know it's not time to mock those with a good report. It's time to believe those with a good report. In Jesus' name. So I wanna pray for you today. If you would just bow your hearts and your heads for a minute, I wanna give you an opportunity to respond. You know, part of the word, it's so critical that we respond, that we take a minute and activate the truth that we just heard. For some of you right now, you heard me share my story and you, you heard about my moment in the backseat of a car where I decided that I was gonna live for Christ. And you would say to me right now, you know, Havilah, 
I've never had my backseat moment. I just was born in church or someone just brought me here. I've just been attending with my spouse or I just kind of was raised in this, but I've never ever gone public with my faith. I've never, I've never said, I have a call on my life. I wanna follow Jesus Christ and I've never done that. And it's time in the middle of this moment, in this season in our nation, I feel this drawing and this pulling that says, I cannot do life like I've always done it. I need to shift. I need a savior. I'm tired of trying to save myself. I'm bankrupt emotionally and mentally and relationally and I need to be rescued. And if that's you and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, but you would like to do that today, I want to invite you by simply and courageously raising your hand and just waving it at me and saying, I'd like to do that. Anybody else? Just wave at me right now. Don't be afraid. Just say, that's all I'm going to have you do. Just wave at me and say, that's me. Anybody else that say, I've never done it before. Good. Anybody else? Just wave at me. Anybody else? Don't, don't miss this moment, please. It's so critical. These are where lives get shifted and changed. Anybody else? all the way to the top. I see you. Yes. Yes. Some of you today would say, you know, Havala, before this pandemic, I would have thought I was a strong believer, but honestly, with everything that's been going on in the nation, I felt my faith being slipping through my hands and I've lost my conviction. I've lost my clarity. I've lost Jesus being at the center of my life. And you know what? I want to put him back. I want to come home. I don't want to wander anymore. I don't want to be confused anymore. I need to give my life back to Jesus Christ. It's time. I need to come home. If that's you, I want you to courageously lift and wave your hand at me and say, that's me. I got to come home. Anybody else? Good. Just wave at me. Don't hesitate. Anybody else? Just wave at me and say, that's me. Yeah. Anybody else? Yeah, I even see a young mom in this room right now and you're saying, I need to do this. You've got littles and you're like, I cannot do this on my own. If that's you, just wave at me and say, that's me. I, 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 yeah, yeah, I saw you. You have a little, a little one that needs, that needs a lot of help and, you, and they're wearing you out and you're feeling overwhelmed. And I saw God just saying, I got you, I'm holding you. Yeah, anybody else to say that's me? And for some of you, you would say, Havala, um, I have some giants that I am facing. I mean, they're financial. I don't know with my business and my staff, I don't know what it's gonna look like, but it's very serious. Maybe you work in a hospital and you're part of the medical field and you go, we need, we have huge giants. Maybe it's relational, your marriage is in trouble or your family dynamics are in trouble or maybe it's physical where you've dealt with sickness and you feel vulnerable and the giants you are facing or maybe it's mental where you're dealing with depression and anxiety. If that's you, I want you to courageously lift your hand and say, I got some giants right now that I need to face. Yeah, if you would be so bold, I'm gonna invite you to take one more step. If you have a giant you need to face, I want you to stand right now. As David faced Goliath, I want you to face your giant and say, I'm not gonna bow down to fear right now. Nobody knows what giant you face. Don't let them judge you. This is your moment and your giant. But I want you to stand and say, Havilah, I got some giants I need to face today. I need courage. I need clarity. I need a radical uh, deliverance. I need a miracle. If that's you, just stand. Don't hesitate. Don't stop. Just stand. This is your moment. That's it right now. Just stand for a minute. I'm with you. I'm standing with you because I got some giants too, guys. This is not just for somebody else. This is for me too. I'm standing. I want you just to lift your hands as a sign of surrender. I want you to say this out loud. Lord Jesus, you know you've brought me this far. And now that I see the promise ahead of me, I also see the giants. I need your help to defeat the giants in my life. Fear, come on, speak it out. Unbelief, anxiety, discouragement, confusion. I see you. I'm going after you. You are not going to hinder me from my promise. Holy Spirit, be my guide. Holy Spirit, anoint me this very moment in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen and amen. Give God a clap offering.